Well, I, I recently read about a, a Bible school student in the Philippines who became disturbed over the condition of the men's restrooms at the school because they always seemed to be neglected in the cleaning routine. When nothing was done to eliminate the filth, he decided to do something about it. So he went to the school principal and he complained. A little while later, the student noticed that the problem was being corrected. And then one day, he saw something that amazed him. The man with the mop and bucket in hand, washing the bathrooms, was the principal himself. Later, the student commented, I thought he would call a janitor, but he cleaned the toilets himself. It was for him a major lesson on being a servant. And of course, it raised a question in my own mind as to why I hadn't taken care of the problem myself. With that story in mind, I want you to now turn with me to our verse for this morning. And I do mean verse, one verse, Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, it's small, it's short, but it will be our launching pad into other verses this morning. Here is what we read in Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. We read past that so quick when we read the greetings in the scriptures. We just read over it. But there's so much in one verse. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. There are many titles that a Christian can have. Saint, child, ambassador. But there is a title that we might be slower to give ourselves. It is that title that Paul gives himself here, servant. Paul says that he is a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. This is Paul's opening greeting to the Roman church. And the title he gives himself first and foremost is not what we would think is the most impressive, which is, I'm an apostle. The first title he gives himself first and foremost is servant. Servant of Christ and the gospel. Now, here's the thing about this verse. And in fact, most of the New Testament. Every time you hear that word, servant, it is often as it is here, the word doulos in the Greek. And that word means something much deeper than just servant. It actually means slave. In the Old Testament, it's the word abed, and it is very much the same as servant or a slave. If we were to read Romans 1.1 1, 1 with the Greek meaning in full view, we can read it like this. Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. But because we are quick at the, uh, uh, to wince, I think, at the term slave, our Bible translate this as either servant or bond servant. That might be in your scriptures, bond servant. Bond servant is actually a much better rendering because it's, it gets to the meaning of the term better. But in all truth, the term taken to its fullest end is slave. Paul sees himself not simply as a servant of Jesus in the gospel, but as a bondservant, a slave to Jesus Christ in the gospel. He's given up all rights to himself, and he's fully owed to his master. And this is not a title that's limited to Paul, okay? No, it is a title that's given to Abraham, it's a title that's given to David, and it is to be taken up by all believers in Jesus Christ. In fact, even Jesus Christ said, that he didn't count equality with God something to be grasped, but he became a servant. Same word, slave. He became a slave. And so I want us to recognize that we each in Christ are bond servants to the Lord. Each one of us who have come into being believers in Jesus Christ, saved, born again, we are bond servants in the Lord. And I want to contrast the idea of a bondservant up against the idea of being a volunteer. Christians are not volunteers in the church. We're bondservants. We're slaves to Christ. And so that's our first point for this morning. Number one, Christians are all bondservants for Christ. 
Now, I want to explain this morning what it means that we who are in Christ are bond servants for the Lord. But before I do, I want us to contrast again that term volunteer up against the word bond servant. I think some of us can get caught up in the thinking that we volunteer in the church, that we volunteer our time in a charity, that we volunteer ourselves here at Kentwood or elsewhere, wherever you might serve. But I want us to change our thinking this morning and move from the mindset of volunteerism to a bond servant for Christ. The difference is massive and has huge implications for each one of us. Whether you see yourself as a volunteer or a bond servant for Christ will change everything about how you are used in the kingdom of God. It will change everything about the attitude you bring to what you do for Christ. The difference is massive. In this church, we have people that serve in music. We have people that serve in different helps, kitchen, teaching, organizing, sound, media, cleaning, administration, and so on. So I say to all of us who serve here, are you a volunteer or are you bond servants? Which is it? Let me tell you the difference. A volunteer shows up as a nice and kind gesture to help with a good cause. A bond servant shows up as an act of worship to their God. A volunteer gives of their extra time to be helpful. A bond servant gives themselves to God in all things. Elizabeth Elliot said this about being a servant of the Lord. She says, it's about giving up my rights. All of me for you, God, forever. She said that the moment we come to Christ, we're like a blank sheet of paper with our signature at the bottom of it, and Jesus is free to fill in the paper as he sees fit in terms of what he wants to do with my life. This is not a volunteer. This is a bond servant for Jesus. I want to take us through some scriptures this morning to help us understand this idea of every Christian being a bond servant, and so you can flip to those verses if you'd like, or you can just let me read them as I go along. It's up to you. But the first thing every Christian needs to realize as a sub-point here is that we have been bought with a price. We already mentioned that today in our communion time, but we have been bought with a price. You are literally purchased of God. Where have we heard that? Isn't there a song about that? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. 1 Corinthians 7, 22 to 23, speaks to this saying, for he who, has call, who was called in the Lord as a bondservant, he says, is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. He says, you were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So Paul is speaking here to the Corinthian church, saying to the slaves, the actual slaves in the church, that if you became a Christian as a slave, then even as a slave, he says, you're now a free man. You're a free man in Christ. You're no longer enslaved uh, to, to spiritual darkness and to the slavery of sin. You're no longer that. To Satan. Likewise, he says, if you are a free person, not a slave, and you were called to Christ, you are now a bondservant or a slave of Christ. So Paul reinforces this idea that believers in Christ are slaves to Christ, bondservants. Why are we bound to Christ? Because we've been bought with a price, he says. That price, Christ's blood, Christ's death on the cross, has purchased dead, fallen men and women for himself. And I know we're a long ways from Christmas, but I sure love the song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. He paid for your soul with his life. God the Father paid for you with the death of his own son to redeem you from the hand of the enemy. An ultimate price was paid for you and I, and in this sense, you are purchased. You belong to Christ. Slavery to the world is a terrible thing. But in the case, in this case, we've been bought or purchased by God. A master who is good, a master who cares for us, a master who has rescued us with, his, with this purchase of our soul. He has swept us up 
from an eternal fire. So we are not volunteers in the kingdom. We are bondservants bought with a price, the most precious price of all, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. So in this sense, we should be able to say, I am not my own. I am not my own as a Christian. I belong to God. You belong to God. We do not have autonomy anymore. We are in Him and He is in us. My body is not my own, so I don't get to do with my body whatever I want to do. I need to honor the Lord with my body. My mind is not my own. I need to love Him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. My time is not my own. I don't get to waste it, but I need to use it to glorify the Lord. My gifts are not my own. He's the one who created me and given me my talents and my skills and my gifts. Am I using them to honor him? They all belong to Christ. As slaves to Christ, we are subject to him. I don't volunteer myself in the church or in that ministry or in this ministry. I'm taking all the gifts, talents, skills, mind, body that he has given me and I use them to serve him. I'm worshiping him, not volunteering. You and I, brothers and sisters, are bond servants for the Lord. We've been bought with a price. The next sub point to this not only are we bond servants because we're bought with a price, but we're also bond servants because we've been captured by love. I want to put it that way to you captured by love. Slaves in this world were captured against their will. African tribes. If you don't know the history, when we typically think of slavery in our world and we think about the early United States and the slavery that went on, African tribes attacked other African tribes and took slaves and then shipped them across. Arabic nations would come down and take Africans and put them on trade ships and send them across. They came with tyranny and harm to them to make them a slave captured by those who are hateful and wish to resort a man down to nothing but property. But God has not captured us as slaves in this way. We have been captured by his love, a love that died in our place, a love that rescues rather than condemns. When I think of the sinner that I am, and the love that he showed me, I am captured by his love to serve him and be bound to him for the rest of eternity. His love has cast down my rebellious will. His love died on the cross. His love has caused me to be born again. Thus we read in Romans 12:1. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is what worship's about. I'm offering all of me to you as a living sacrifice. That's why I say when we give of our tithes, it's got to come from the heart. You know, in the Old Testament, when they were doing the sacrifices of the animals and the priests were just complaining, oh, all day long, I'm up to my elbows in blood. It was awful. God says, I hate your sacrifices. I don't want nothing to do with them. God's always wanted us to be a living sacrifice in view of God's mercy. While they're slaughtering the bull or the animal on the sacrificial table, they should have been saying, look how God has provided grace for us. Praise God. I know this is messy work. I know this is hard. But look how he's provided grace and mercy, his love. And the same thing is true for us. We've been captured by his love. In view of God's mercy, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, not as volunteers, as bondservants for the Lord. This is true and proper worship. A bondservant recognizes that God has lo God's love has been shown in his grace and mercy for sinners, and therefore, Paul says, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, and that living sacrifice is a true act of worship. As I give of my talents, my time, my efforts, I'm worshiping. As I sacrifice my wants and will for his, I'm worshiping. Volunteers don't offer their bodies as living sacrifices. Bond servants do. We are to be happy to be spent and used by God for his glory. What else can I do? What else can I do and we do in the face of God's love? How else can I show him that I love him except that I serve him well 
with all my heart. Believers find themselves bond servants, slaves, because we've been captured by his love. And in view of God's mercy and grace, we become living sacrifices for him. And finally, last sub-point here, being a bond servant also means that we're not simply a hired hand. In John chapter 10, Jesus describes the difference between a hired hand and a true shepherd. And he says a hired hand will run away when he sees the wolves. When things become difficult, the hired hand will leave because it's only about their wage. I'm not getting in the way of the wolf. I just came here for a paycheck. But the true shepherd is one who loves the sheep and faces the wolves in the difficulty because he's not about the money. He's willing to put himself in the way of the mouth of the, of the uh, wolf. They actually care for the sheep. They actually want to serve the chief shepherd well with his flock. And anyone who works in the church as a paid position can either be just a hired hand or they can be a bondservant for the Lord. If a hired hand, then there's no mission except to get paid. If a bondservant, then it's worship to God. God, I want you to be glorified and I want your people to grow towards you, right? The same is true for each of us. If you simply volunteer, then when things get difficult, it's easy to walk away. Who needs this? After all, I'm, I'm just a volunteer. I don't need this abuse. I'm out of here. A bond servant will serve out of worship to God. They will serve with the mission of the gospel in mind. Just as Paul said in Romans 1.1, I, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. There are so many times in ministry where if I was just a volunteer or a hired hand, it'd be easy to say, this is ridiculous, I'm out of here. But what keeps me enduring in the role of pastor is the recognition that I'm a bond servant to Christ. You can have that same perspective in anything you do for the Lord, and it will keep you enduring onward through the difficulties and through the mess that is church. The mess that is church. It is something every believer here today has to get right in their head. The moment we are saved, we become bond servants, ushered into the kingdom of God, given a mission of the gospel, and we have been bought with a price. I'm not my own. I've been captured by his love. I'm a living sacrifice for him. I'm not a hired hand. I serve him not for money, but to do well for him. So you're not volunteers. You're bond servants of the Lord. We look to God and we say, do what you will with me. Use me. So ask yourself, those of you who serve at Kentwood in various ministries, are you a volunteer? Or are you a bondservant for Jesus Christ? Is it this organization that you're primarily working for? Is it Pastor Garrett and the elders? Or is it Jesus Christ? What is it? Are we trying to make ourselves in the name of Kentwood great? Or are we trying to make God great and trying to show him as great among the world and the gospel? That's where we know we're on mission, a true mission not just about making Kentwood popular within the city of Red Deer. It's about making God um, shown to our city for the sake of the gospel. Amen. And this brings us to our second point for today. What's the outcome of being a bondservant? The outcome of being a bondservant, number two. First sub-point, we serve God, not man. When we volunteer for something, we typically are serving a place, an organization, a leader, and although it's also a virtue for us as Christians to serve one another, the reality is that something changes when we say that the one I serve first and foremost is God. And so the scriptures tell us in Colossians 3 that we are to do everything as unto the Lord. And so part of being a bondservant for Christ is that all we do is unto the Lord. And that passage goes on to say to do everything as unto the Lord and not to men, knowing that from God you will receive your inheritance. So going to work 
raising my family, cooking, cleaning, serving in the church, etc. Every single job that we do should be as unto the Lord. He is the one we are working for. He's the one who will say, well done, good and faithful servant. He is the one who will see your efforts, even the ones in secret that nobody else sees, and reward you for your faithfulness. Why does that make a difference? Because of this. When I am serving the Lord, it changes how I serve and with what heart I serve from. When our custodians clean the church, they're not ultimately working for Kentwood. They're not working for the pastor. They're working for the Lord. They're preparing a building for the worship of the Lord and for this body to gather. When our media team takes the slides for the songs, they're not just doing it because they volunteered for that, but they are making it possible for us to sing to God each Sunday together. All of these jobs go from jobs we do for an organization as a volunteer to a devotion of our faith to the Lord. A volunteer does their work for an organization, whereas bond servants works as unto the Lord. Working as unto the Lord also protects us from being people pleasers in the world. Being a people pleaser may cause us to compromise on what is true and cause us to compromise on what is taught in Scripture. It causes us to compromise on what God's will is. But being a bondservant who works as unto the Lord will do all things with a single goal in mind. First, it's to please the Lord in all things. So for a preacher, you preach the hard stuff, knowing it might not please people to hear, but it will please the Lord. Galatians 1.10 says it well, for I am now, he says, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? Then he says, if I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant, do loss, slave of Christ. So a bond servant's outcome will have the will of God in mind, the upbuilding of the body, the mission of the gospel, not simply a job done as a volunteer. I care about God. I care about the gospel. But if the mission of the gospel and the, and the working unto the Lord is our goal, that should lead us to another outcome. Excellence as an expression of love. That's our next subpoint. Excellence as an expression of love. I have found that serving in the church can get frustrating if my focus is just other people and I could get into the habit of just getting the job done. But a bond servant who loves the Lord and works as unto the Lord will strive for excellence in what they do. Strive to do a good job. They will have integrity. They will show up on time. They'll want to do well in order to please the Lord and to help in the work of the gospel. When you serve here at church, are you thinking of the Great Commission? Are you thinking that we are to go into the world and make disciples? Is that your thinking as we do this? That everything we do is part of our mission? And as we do those things, well, we bring glory to God and hopefully we remove any obstacles that may be a distraction to the body or to the non-believer. I'm reminded that 2 Chronicles 34 shows how the Levites who were to play music for the Lord, it says they played skillfully for the Lord. It's always caught me. Here in modern times, there are many things that we put our hands to that we ought to do skillfully. Not as a vain endeavor. Not to be attractional. But actually as an act of worship. I often think about the temple and the way they built it and the way these skilled craftsmen built the temple. With all of their gusto, with all of their skill, they made this amazing place for the worship of God. If I'm doing everything as under the Lord, it means that I'll wish to do it well. And I think that's maybe one way we can know if we are a volunteer or a bond servant. A volunteer, let's just get the job done. A bond servant, I wanna do this well for the Lord. Does a child not do the best that they can in order to please their father? When they draw a picture, or they play an instrument, or do something athletic, do they not say, hey, dad, look what I did? In the same way, we can be in a place where as bond servants, we have been captured by his love, and we wish to do all things well for him with excellence. And so a bond servant must be in a place where work is worship. Work is worship. Where service is done because we love him where we are not working for an organization but unto the Lord together. So what is it that you do? 
What sorts of things do you do in the church or outside of the church or maybe in a parachurch organization? Whatever it is, do it as a bondservant to Christ. And the last sub point for this is endurance. We kind of spoke to this already. Being a bondservant will lead to endurance. God says, run the race marked out for you, right? Wherever we serve in any capacity, there will be frustrations. There will be complications. There will be things that people who will cause you to want to perhaps stop serving. Just like we've mentioned before, in any race, there's lots of times where it's like, I think I should just stop now. (laughs) Pull off to the side. The rest can keep going. There will be plenty of reasons to quit. Plenty of reasons to quit. Maybe even church itself. And if you're a volunteer, then I don't blame you. Why should you have to put up with all the complication? Why should you have to go through all that? You could do a lot more things with your time. Why why should I bother with all this frustration? But as bond servants, we are suddenly rooted and grounded in a deeper truth and mission. There are souls to be saved, there are sheep to be led, there are disciples to be made. I'm here to serve my Lord, I'm here to build up the saints, I'm here to further the work of the gospel. I'll open my time, my gifts, my skills, I'll build that area that I'm responsible for. I will do it with excellence, I will endure through the frustrations because I'm not just sweeping floors, I'm not just making slides, I'm not just getting up early and doing sound, I'm not just setting up tables and washing dishes, I'm not just setting up a men's night or a women's tea or a youth event, no, I'm serving God with all I have and I will not grow weary in doing good for in due time there will be a harvest and I will give of myself to the Lord for I am not my own. I was bought at a price. I was captured by his love for me and I am a product of grace. That perspective is what causes us to endure for as long as the Lord will use me because it's not about me and it's not about my volunteerism. It's about worship. It's about the mission of the gospel It's about building up the body of Christ. It's about God. And I finally want to ask this question. What fallen behavior does being a bondservant address? I had a friend this week say something, and I think it's helped me very much in even my own sermon prep. You're always learning as a preacher. And he said, he said, always ask the question when you come to these truths, what fallen thing, what fallen nature in me does this truth address? What does it push back against in terms of my sinfulness and my fallen nature? So what is this teaching that I am a slave to Christ address in terms of my fallen nature? Well, it deals with my pride. It deals with my selfishness. It calls me out from it all being about me and what I can get, and it puts my eyes back on Jesus and the mission of the gospel. It also turns me from my own kingdom and focuses my work on the kingdom of God. I'm not here to build up myself, but to make much of Jesus Christ and his gospel. It deals with my lack of integrity that says I will do the most minimal job necessary and instead pushes me to be an excellent builder for the Lord. It takes away the need for personal comfort and leaves no room for the lazy heart. It makes me totally dependent on God. I'm not my own. I am a living sacrifice for him. I am a bondservant. And I'm overjoyed to be a slave for Christ. I can't think of a more countercultural thought or statement. I'm overjoyed to be a slave for Christ. In a world where it's all about personal freedom, in a world where it's all about getting what I want and my rights, we have this place in the gospel that says, I'm overjoyed to be a slave for him. So as we come to the end now, I have one final thought. There is a passage out of Exodus 21. Some of you may know it. It's a foreshadow, I think, of our slavery to Christ. And I just want to read you these verses, verses 2 to 6 from Exodus 21. There's lots of passages in the Old Testament about slavery that make us very uncomfortable. And this might be one of them. But I want you to hear the foreshadowing of Christ in it. If you buy a Hebrew servant, slave, He is to serve you for six years. But in the seventh year, he shall go free without paying anything. And if he comes alone, he is to go free alone. But if he has a wife when he comes, she is to go with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the woman and her children shall belong to her master and only the man shall go free. 
But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door or the doorpost and shall pierce his ear with an awl, and then he will be his servant for life. Literally, bond servant. In the Old Testament, a slave was an indentured worker. He was a person who was to work for and or pay off a debt to the master. It was not chattel slavery like we see in the world today or in the early years of the United States where people were property like cattle and all over the world, which is still practiced today. It wasn't like that. It was indentured servitude. So the scripture says after six years, the seventh year was always the year to set free their slaves. Let them go. But there are cases like the one here where the slave decides that I actually love my master. I love working for him. I do not wish to go out from him. I wish to serve him for life. And he would put his ear to the post. They would drive an all through his ear and he would be a servant for life. In the same sense, we as Christians are in a place under this picture of being a bondservant where we say, I love my master. I love my Lord Jesus. I love the family of God. I love my God. I don't wish to be set free from him. So we choose figuratively to put our ears to the post and be declared God's servant forever. Imagine if that was the altar call these days. (laughs) Jesus said to his disciples, I no longer call you slaves or servants, but friends. There's this wonderful relationship where we we can be both the friends of Christ and the bondservants of Christ. We're the same one whom we lovingly are enslaved to, we're also friends with, co-heirs to the kingdom, brothers and sisters with. All the world's evils and all the world's perversions and abuses are corrected and made right in the kingdom of God. We're happy to serve the one who died for us. So are you a volunteer Or are you a bondservant? Is your service an act of worship? Or is it just another job? Or am I even serving him at all? Decide today who you are working for. For you were bought with a price. So I end with this from the Heidelberg Catechism. The song we sang today was actually about that from the Heidelberg Catechism. And I love it. What is your comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but I belong body and soul in life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That is our great comfort in life and death. I'm not my own. I belong to him. What a hope and comfort indeed. Far from being a drudgery, as a bondservant, we are to say, praise God that I belong to him. What a good and gracious master we serve, not as a volunteer, but as a bondservant. Amen. Let's pray.